I guess I was probably in my mid-30s-ish, when I finally realized that God had a plan specific to my life. I mean, before that, I, I thought God's plan was, don't go to hell, go to heaven. <laughs> and that's a plan, right? But that's a plan for everybody. But I, I didn't realize until, again, in my 30s, that there was, there was more specific plans than that that God had for me. And um, before that time, so before that realization, um, I, and I realized that I was living, as I look back, kind of living behind what um, God's plan was for me was. Like I, wasn't, like I wasn't stepping into his plans probably in the timing that maybe he would have wanted me to step into them. I was kind of a latecomer, so to speak. But then when... Um, when I realized that God actually speaks to us and he began speaking to me, not audibly, but I just, you just know the voice of God in your spirit. And um, I, like, I got excited about that. I'm like, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm doing this. And from that time on, there were times that I would kind of get ahead of God. So I kind of went from like being behind maybe in keeping up with God's plans for my life, like not stepping into it probably when I should have, to sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes kind of getting ahead of his plans, even though I knew it was a plan. Um, the football term is I was outrunning my coverage, right? I was getting out too far ahead, like God would give me some insight or something of something to do or a plan, like, and I would just take it and run. And then sometimes I get too far ahead, and um, that, um, I think some of that was maybe youthful exuberance. <laughs> yes, when you're 35, you're a youth, all right? But, but you, you know, just like when you get excited about following Christ, um, there's an exuberance there, and you, you just want to do it. I think there's some of that, but honestly, I think some of it, when I would get, got ahead of God, was just personal ambition and and personal desires, and uh, God always worked it out. You know, even though I might have been a little behind in kind of keeping up with his plans or getting ahead of his plans and kind of maybe mucking it up a little bit, he always worked it out. Now, there was some times there was some collateral damage because of that, but, but he always worked it out. And so here's one thing I've learned from all that, and this is actually point one this morning, it's this, falling behind on God's plan for our life can have consequences. But getting ahead of God's timing can also have consequences. I've learned that. There are consequences for not being in step with God, whether you're behind where, he, where he's asking you to go or you're jumping out ahead. God has a specific plan for your life. I know sometimes some Christians like, over-specify it, like they can't decide if they should buy whole wheat bread or white bread. Like, God, what do you, what do you say? I should, like, God, like, doesn't care. Just buy the bread and then, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, you know, do that stuff, right? Um, <laughs> he gives us a lot of decisions to make on our own, for sure. But, he, but there are plans that he has for you, and he wants you to be in step with those plans, not, not behind, not ahead. And today we're going to look as part of our Bible Engagement Project at the life of Jacob. Um, Bible Engagement Project is a, a 40-week project. We started here uh, end of August, I guess. We've been, we're preaching through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in 40 weeks. So we started in September. We'll finish with Revelation on June 2nd. And so if, if you stick with us, you're going to get to go all through the Bible. Now, obviously, in 40 weeks, just for, you know, half hour, 40 minutes on a Sunday, we can't get every little nuance of the Bible from beginning to end. But we're going we're gonna to hit the high spots and the important parts of it, and uh, we're glad you're a part of that. But we're looking at Jacob today, and how he, he got ahead of God's plan for his life. God had a specific plan for Jacob, but Jacob, with some help from his mom, kind of outran his coverage, kind of got out a little far ahead of God's plan and started kind of maybe even like actually manipulating things and modifying God's plan. And it, 
it kind of mucked it up a little bit. But, but eventually, Jacob got back on track. He got back in step with God, and it, it turned out very powerful. And so we're going to look at that today. Like, what, I mean, we're going to look at, like, what Jacob did kind of historically, and what, but what was it, more importantly, what was it that got him back on track? And even more importantly than that, it's like, how does that relate to you? Because it, it does. And I want, I want you to catch this as we go through this today, because the same thing that happened in Jacob that got him back on track with God's plan can happen for you. And we want that for you. So we're going to start, though, by looking at this historical account of Jacob and kind of what went on, how he got out ahead of things. Um, so... Uh, I'm going to start in Genesis 25, verse 19 through 23. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other. She was pregnant with twins. Um, the babies jostled each other, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older, the older will serve the younger. So Rebecca's carrying twins, and uh, their names are Esau and Jacob. Esau was the firstborn, so he was the older. Even though there was probably, probably just minutes difference uh, in, in their time of birth, it, it may as well have been years as far as their tradition goes and inheritance. Because in that culture, the oldest son would get a double inheritance. He would be the sort of de facto leader of the family when, when, the, when the old man <laughs> passed from the scene. It was a big deal. He, he, he would be richer. He would have more power in the family, more high standing in others. It was a big deal. And normally in that culture, that would be Esau because he was first born. But God told Rebecca, like, mm, no, it's going to kind of switch around here the older one will end up serving the younger one. And it, like, I've got plans for both of them, but that younger one, I got big plans for him. And so that's, that's what uh, he was telling us, that Jake would be a leader. So just to kind of, I guess, FYI it, <laughs> Jacob became, Jacob was later named Israel. Uh, that's God, so God named him that. So Israel, which is a nation now, started in 19, well, started again in 1948, had not been a nation since 586 BC. So for about 2,500 years, Israel was not a nation. So it was, a, it was nothing. And then Jacob is named Israel. And God starts the nation and the people of Israel and the Jewish race through Jacob. And then they kind of disappeared for a while. 1948, they're back. So that's, that's how we got the, the Jewish people, God's chosen people, and Israel, all right, through Jacob. Um, Esau's descendants became, well, well, I guess generally, the Arabs. And you know, <laughs> even if you don't watch the news, how the Jews and the Arabs have been clashing for like literally thousands of years. And, and God kind of said, These two, there's two nations in you, and they're going to they're gonna kind of butt heads. And that's been true. And the, the, the nation, um, Esau, um, uh, I don't want to get too complicated with this. Abraham, Isaac's dad, he tried to get ahead of God's plan. We talked about that, I think, last week, where Ab uh, God told Abraham, hey, you and your wife, Sarah, are going to have a baby. Except that Abraham at that time was 80. Sarah was 60 or 70. And they're like, we're way, we're way too old. 
And it was even like, what, 20 years later before she had the baby. But before that happened, Sarah's like, obviously I'm too old to have a baby. God said there's going to be a great nation through Abraham. So why don't you sleep with my, my maid, my servant, make a baby, and we'll get on with this God's plan thing. Well, that wasn't God's plan. And she had a baby named Ishmael. Ishmael's daughter ends up marrying Esau. So that line of Ishmael um, through Esau starts the Arab race. The line of Jacob starts the the nation of Israel and and the Jews and God's chosen people. Do you kind of see how that all started? Jacob had 12 sons, and those became the 12 tribes of Israel. Right? So there's your history lesson. All right. So uh, moving up a couple chapters. Genesis 27. So now Jacob and Esau are young men, and mom's like, okay, when, when are we going to get on with this Jacob being the leader thing? Because Jacob was kind of apparently kind of a mama's boy. <laughs> I'm sure he was powerful. Esau was the hunter. Esau was big and hairy and hunter. And dad liked Esau, very manly. Esau would go hunt game and bring it to him. And dad like, Esau, that's my boy. And Jacob, he was like, he, he's kind of with mom. So mom kind of likes Jacob. Dad kind of likes Esau. Let's pick up the story. Genesis 27, verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I'm now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now my son, listen Carefully and do what I tell you. This is mom talking. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. A little manipulation going on there. It's like God didn't say, hey, Jacob's going to need Isaac's blessing for this all to happen. He never said that. That would be normal, but he, God never said that. So... Rebecca's trying to, like, make things happen. She's outrunning her coverage a little bit here. Um, Verse 11, I think is where I left off. Jacob said to uh, to Rebecca, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say and go get them for me. So again, God never told Rebecca to do this. She's like, she's taken this all upon herself. We've got to get on with God's plan here. Let's get going. Verse 14, so he, uh, Jacob, went and got them and brought them to his mother, the goats. She prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with goat skins. The guy must have been really hairy. (laughs) Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How'd you find it so quickly, my son? Lord, your God gave me success, he said. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, 
The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, so he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau, he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate. And he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him, kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son, like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. Somebody should make that a fragrance for men. <laughs> smell of a field, right? Down to verse 30 in Genesis 27. After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. Ooh, now it gets interesting. He, prepared, uh, he too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, And who are you? <laughs> I'm your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright. That's a story you can read about if you go back a little bit. He took my birthright from me, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I've made him lord over you, and I've made him and all his relatives servants, or made all his relatives ser ser his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. Now fast forward down to verse 41. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I'll kill my brother Jacob. When we try to manipulate God's plan, things get twisted. And manipulation happens in, within God's people, <laughs> and it never turns out well, because it's not God's plan. God is not a manipulator, and he doesn't want you to manipulate. And he doesn't want you to get ahead of things either, and both things were going on here. And when those things go on, things get dysfunctional. Again, there's so, it's such an interesting story. You should keep reading when you, when you get home. Um, but Jacob spent the next several years living with the consequences of, of getting ahead of God's plan and trying to modify the plan and all the manipulation and deceit. He, he kind of had to live with the consequences of that for, for a while. What's interesting, again, I'm not going to cover it today, but his... <laughs> Jacob began, was deceived and manipulated by his soon-to-be father-in-law, Laban. Again, you can read that, but it was like, as, as Christians, we don't believe in karma, you know, what goes around comes around, but we do believe in sowing and reaping. <laughs> That's kind of Christian karma, right? Like you reap what you sow, and if you sow deceit and manipulation, that's probably you're going to reap some of that. <laughs> and certainly Jacob did as a consequence of, of what happened. But again, just like in my life, God still has a plan. And even though we, we muck it up, he'll, he'll, <laughs> he'll try to get us back on track if we'll kind of get, if we'll kind of get back on track with him. And things, things can and, and will work out. But as I mentioned earlier, there was a point in Jacob's life when all this monkey business stopped. <laughs> we were at our staff meeting this Wednesday and we were talking about this passage and I used the term monkey business. I haven't used that term for years. Does anybody else use the term monkey business? Remember that? Like, what's the, all the monkey business going on? I hope that's not inappropriate because I've been using it. But anyway, it's like, that was a good term, monkey business. Like, what's all the monkey business going on here? But at some point that stopped. 
with Jacob. And he got back on track with God. So the question is, what was it that kind of got Jacob back on the right track? What was it? And furthermore, what, is it, what does that have to do with you? Well, um, thank you for asking. Are, are you asking? Would you like to know what it has to do with you? Good, because otherwise I got nothing. We're done. But like, you're like, awesome. Anyway, no, we're getting to the good part here. So, after all this monkey business, and, and Jacob has uh, been deceived by his father-in-law, and he's, he's ended up having to work, off, work for his wives, and it was crazy. But for, uh, he's kind of taken a trip on his own, which he hardly ever did, but he's out in the desert all by himself. And it gets night. So he lays down, goes to sleep, and... God gives him a dream. God shows him this very vivid dream and shows it to him. And and God can actually be in dreams. And it's biblical that he does that to people to show us something and teach us something or whatever. And so Jacob falls asleep. And in this dream or vision, whatever it was, he sees this stairway to heaven. So like that didn't start with like, who did that song, Stairway... Was that that Stairway to Heaven? Yeah. Yeah, We're not going to play that today, so don't worry about that. (laughs) So Led Zeppelin actually, you know, wrote a biblical song. Well, no, he didn't write it. He had a biblical title. It wasn't a biblical song. Stairway to Heaven. So Jacob saw this, and he saw angels going up and down this stairway. And then he saw God. Like, he saw God on this stairway. It's like, whoa. Um, And... Jacob, uh, God reaffirms the promise he'd given Abraham. He reaffirms it with Jacob. So God, in this dream, standing on the stair, he goes, Jacob, I'm making you a great nation. You're going to have descendants, and your descendants are going to be a blessing to the world. Because what he's saying is, I'm I'm paraphrasing, is the Messiah is going to be a Jew, Jesus is going to be a Jew, and he's going to come from your line, and it's going to bless the world. He didn't say it that clearly, but that's what he meant. So, this all happens, and Jacob wakes up. Like, whoa. Genesis 28, verse 16. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So, when Jacob saw angels coming up and down the stairs, what that was a picture of is the resources of heaven. Like, heaven is a lot closer than we think, spiritually. And the resources of heaven are available to us. And the presence of God is available to us. And God was showing that to Jacob And that moment, if you read in the Bible, from there on, Jacob quit being a deceiver, mostly. (laughs) He quit being a manipulator, and he got lined up with God's plan. It was a significant moment in in Jacob's life. And so there's some really important things here we want to look at. He says, wow, this is like, this is the house of God. This is the gateway of heaven. So, What we know from this is that the house of God is the gateway to an open heaven. All right? It's the house of God, gateway to an open heaven. That's what this says. God's house is wherever he dwells. Right? So if he later on after Jacob, like a few hundred years after, 400 years after Jacob, he dwells in the tabernacle, then the temple. I mean, God's everywhere present. We get that, right? You can't go where God is not. We're talking about his manifest presence. He's like, whoa, God's here. Like he's everywhere, but no, he's really here, and we know he's here. Manifest presence. His house is wherever he dwells, wherever that manifest presence is. Um, But Jacob seems really surprised that God was with him. He's like, whoa, I'm out in the middle of nowhere, and here's God with me, in the middle of nowhere, that was a, quite a revelation to him. 
And not only was it God, but all the resources of heaven coming and going like, whoa, like right here in the middle of nowhere. Again, like I said, from that moment on, there was a change in Jacob, no more monkey business. Even when he was the one being manipulated, because the manipulation that happened to him didn't stop here. Even though he, he still was being deceived by Laban, he was still being manipulated, but he didn't, he stopped on his part. Uh, that's, I think, significant. So let me, let me lay out point two, and then I want to I wanna get to where I really want to get to today. Point two, spending time in the presence of God and knowing that you live under an open heaven will keep you in step with him and his plans for your life. I've said this a lot because it's true in my life and it's biblical. Nothing has changed my life more than being in the presence of God, his manifest presence. Nothing. I mean, Bible college, great. Well, seminars, great. Teaching from others, great. Bible reading, great. Prayer, great. It's all great. It's all good. Learning, learning and knowing and experiencing, great. But I'm telling you, for my life, nothing has changed it more than just being in the presence of God. Like, everything just seems to make more sense. And you don't struggle with things. You just, like, kind of do it. Um, and that's biblical. And that happened with Jacob. So that was way cool back then. I mean, what happened to Jacob, like he's like saying, way cool, guys. But it gets way cooler. Um, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we're living in a time that's way more awesome than when Jacob lived. And Jacob thought it was pretty awesome. Okay, so let me, let's catch up there. Fact that I already stated. The house of God is the gateway to an open heaven, right? Didn't Jacob say that? The house of God is the gateway to heaven. True, that's biblical. Fact, God's house is wherever he dwells. Yes, fact. Here's the new fact that started with the new covenant. You are the dwelling place of God. Put those together. Connect the dots. The gate of heaven is where God dwells. Or the house of the Lord is the gate of heaven, right? And the house of the Lord is where God dwells. And let me read 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? <laughs> if you didn't know it, you know it now. Most of you knew it. You're the temple of God. When, when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was ripped, giving access to all believers 24-7 to the, pre the manifest presence of God, not the omnipresence. We've always had the omnipresence of God. I'm talking about manifest presence. Like You can be in the presence, the manifest presence of God whenever you want to be. God's not holding out on you. It's like, well, how come I'm not, how come I don't, haven't done that? Well, good question. Well, I don't know. Why not? Because if you're like me, you didn't, number one, you didn't know you could. And, like, and then how do I do that? And like, ooh, is it scary? Am I ready? I'm so unworthy. Uh -oh. Like, get over yourself. <laughs> I mean, seriously, God wants you in his presence. And once you learn that, I feel like I'm getting in another sermon. I need to come back. But like, God wants you to come confidently into his presence. But when, we, when we're loaded with guilt and shame and condemnation, this is one of the reasons why we do free to live. When we carry all this baggage, it's like, well, I'm not going in with all my junk. And he's like, well, come on. I'm like, no, I'm not. Let me, get, let me clean up a little bit before I come in. Well, a little bit never happens. I mean, in our mind. So, you're a gateway of heaven. Because you are the house of God, the Bible says you're the sanctuary. I mean, we call this the sanctuary, but that's not technically. I mean, okay, we get it. This is the sanctuary. You're a sanctuary. You house God. And because you house God, he dwells there. And because he dwells there, it's a gateway to heaven. This is like, think about this. Oh, there's so, I mean, 
three minutes and 30 seconds. I've got to wrap it up. But there's like, you are seated in the heavenlies, the Bible says. Like you're seated here in this seat, but spiritually speaking, because you're in Jesus and Jesus is in you, you're seated in the heavenlies. But the heavenlies aren't like somewhere out there. Jacob learned like, it's right here. I'm not trying to get weird about it. I mean, you know, heaven is a place out there, but, but it's also, we have access to that because we live under an open heaven. Um, living in that place, understanding that you live under an open heaven will change your life because you understand that, that you're in the con- you, can, you can be in the constant manifest presence of God. You understand that the resources of heaven are available, this, those spiritual resources. Like the, all the riches of heaven are available to us. The Bible talks a lot about that. And we just don't draw on that because like, well, not for me. Like, yes, for you. It's like, this is like life-changing stuff, people. It changed my life. It changed yours, changed Jacob. And if, if we as believers can just get this, it's like our lives are going to change. We're not going to, it's not so much struggling. Like, what should I do? Or, oh, I'm trying to, so hard to do the right thing. When you're hanging out with God, you just do it. I mean, it's not like you're perfect, but it's so much easier when you're hanging out with the right people. You just have to wake up to the fact and just start living in that place. I know it sounds like too easy, and I'm not saying it's, I'll say it this, it's not complicated. You know, what makes it hard is that all our junk, like, oh, I'm not worthy, or I'm not in a good spot in my life to do that right now, or I've done this, or I've done that, or I haven't done this, I haven't done that, whatever, and it's like, just, no, come. And get into his presence and understand you live under that open heaven. Change your life. As we conclude this morning, um, just a loving reminder that God doesn't need your modifications to his plans. (laughs) He's a pretty good planner. And he loves you. And he has your best interests in heart. But he's also wanting to advance his kingdom on earth. And I was just talking with Daniel yesterday. We, we went to a Grizz game together. So we had like six hours of visiting. He was a captive audience. So, and he's still here today. So, but we were talking about this. It's like, how often do we like think of God's plan as like career or where, where are we going to live? What town should we live in? Where should I send my kids to school? Uh, what job should I have? And that's good. And God, God may have a specific plan for that. But he may like, well, live where you want to live. But advance the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 10, 7 and 8 says, Jesus says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, raise the dead, preach the gospel. That's what he says. And sometimes we get so wrapped up like, should I be a, a teacher or should I be a nurse? I think sometimes God's like, pick one and then heal the sick, raise the dead. You know, like, what? just pick one and then, but do. So we get so focused on like, what am I going to do as my plan for God? Then we like, but he's got a plan for advancing his kingdom. And, and they often come together. So maybe God might specifically be calling you to be a teacher. He might specifically be calling you to be a nurse. He might specifically call you to be a stay-at-home mom. He, there's... I don't know, it's, but you'll, if you want to know, just hang out with God, and you'll know. And not only will you know that he'll give you the resources to do it. <laughs> it's not complicated, but it's hard because, like, well, because it takes time. Like, spending time in the presence of God is, well, it just takes time. And, and it takes focus, and that's kind of a rare commodity in a lot of our lives right now. But that doesn't mean that it, it's not important. We're going to close this morning, and the uh, worship team is going to come on out uh, as we, I think they're back there. Do we have a worship team? Yeah. Come on out, worship team. There they go. Um,
you are the dwelling place of God. You know that now at least, right? And because you're the dwelling place of God, if you're a believer in Christ, he lives in you if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, just like start believing and he moves in. So you can experience his presence and the resources of heaven wherever you're at. Um, At home, in the car, traveling, in that seat or up here. But today, as we, as we close our service, um, I'm going to have Pastor Norm and Coralyn come on up and we're going to be your, your prayer people today. Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to invite whoever wants to come up, just to come up. And we just want to give you a, a hands-on blessing um, to live under an open heaven, to experience the presence of God. And I'm not saying that you can experience that right where you sit. You can if you just receive it. But for me, sometimes I've taken the uncomfortable step at different times in my life of like coming up to a, what we call the altar, to, a, to a, a place and just surrender. All right, God, here I am. I'm done with the manipulation. I'm done with being behind. I'm done with trying to run out ahead. I'm just here. If, 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 if that's your heart this morning, we just want to lay a hand on you and just We just want to open up the heavens above you and let God rain his blessings down on you and fill you with his his plan, his knowledge, his love, his presence. It will change your life. So if if everybody would stand right now, if you're physically able, and uh, for those of you, when when the worship team starts here in just a second, uh, I'm not going to have you just like come up one at a time. Just everybody come up who wants that. And we're just going to just kind of make a semi-circle around here. And we're just going to start laying a hand on you, praying for you, that that blessing of living under an open heavens, the presence of God. And then if you have any other prayer need, please let us know, and we'd love to pray that for you. So let me just pray, and then we'll, then we'll open up the altar here. God, <laughs> you are so awesome. There is so much you tell us in your words, so much you teach us. Lord, there's things we sometimes read over and don't recognize it for what it is. We don't recognize the impact of the truth of your word that it can have in our life. And so, Lord, I'm so thankful that you open up this biblical principle, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, of of living under an open heaven. Even though this isn't heaven yet, the resources of heaven are available to us. Your presence is available to us. And Lord, I know that it changes lives. And so Lord, we pray for changed lives today as we, your people, move into that place in your presence. So bless us now as we continue on in this service, alter time to follow here. We ask you to bless it in your name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on up if you want us to lay a hand on you this morning.